Thank you all so much for coming, for joining us in fellowship this evening. At the same time, meet you. All right. Good evening, good evening, good evening. And again, I'm going to thank you all for joining us in celebration of our of our, of our anniversary. Today is our anniversary. God has given us a faithful uh, 31 years and we can't thank him enough for it. So good to be able to celebrate it with you uh, live via Facebook. Not Facebook now, go, go to a meeting. And thank you for tuning in. And we're going to this evening, as we look at uh, our study or what we have studied in the in the past, we're going to do something a little bit uh, different. And before we do, uh, j join me in receiving a uh, grace from our Father, uh, Holy God. We bow before Your throne with thanksgiving in our hearts, recognizing that each day is a grace gift from You. We can't thank You enough for the blessings. You have lavished upon us, totally undeserving. We thank you for the brothers and sisters that have joined us throughout the, from, throughout the, the country. And thank you for giving us this opportunity to study your word. It is my prayer that God, the Holy Spirit, who authored the scripture, will move in our own hearts and open our eyes upward to you and grant that our fellowship this evening will be beneficial and this is my prayer in christ's name amen we we are working on uh, colossians colossians chapter one we have uh, gone through from verses one through 18 colossians chapter one verses 1 through 18. What I'm going to do is, of course, I'm sure you already have your pen and uh, paper with you. If you don't, try to find one. I'm sure you do. Because what's Bible class without having a note that you can reflect on? Unless you learn by osmosis. In that case, you don't need any note. But if you are those that uh, one of us that uh, you must look over and over before you can say something, then you need your note. I'm I want to give us five minutes to read, just read on your own Colossians one verses 1 through 18, read on your own, try to have some kind of observation. Because uh, what, we, what I'm going to do this evening is what I call life spiritual application. Life spiritual application. It's not just about learning and learning and learning and studying and studying. It's all about application. And that's what James told us. Don't just be one who studies, it also be one that applies what you study. And so we're gonna learn from we're gonna look at what we have learned over the weeks or so. Colossians one through eighteen, read on your own. See what what really applies to you. What is the lesson that you've learned from these eighteen verses? And then I'll come 
in five minutes and continue to work on it. Colossians 1, verses 1 through 18. Read on your own. All right. Remember what we are, what, I want, what I want us to do is to take what we have learned so far to see how does this uh, uh, lesson apply to us? Or how can we apply this thing to our lives? How can we take what we, what we have on the pages of scripture and transfer it to our own lives, into our souls, and into our application. Like Paul said, that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. How do we do that? And that's the question 
that we have in front of us this evening. Life spiritual application. Colossians chapter 1 verses 1 through 18. The first thing that is that I there are eight things that you probably will have, uh, have that you will probably write down in your notes as we conclude our study this evening. The first one is be quick to hear and slow to respond. Be quick to hear and slow to respond. Where do we get this? Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. Paul, speaking to the uh, Colossians, said, Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow born servant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. As we, as we did, as we learned in our studies, that apparently this was the man who founded the church that the Apostle Paul now writes to. He was the one who brought the news about what was going on in the church. He came and told, he gave Paul good news and bad news. The good news is that they are making spiritual progress. The bad news is that falsehood is trying to threaten the foundation of the church. And that falsehood uh, primarily is the denial of the deity of Jesus Christ. The denial of the deity of Jesus Christ. And so Paul heard this. What did Paul do? Paul will respond to this letter. But he, before you do that, no doubt in my mind, Paul was moving over. How do I respond to this circumstance? How do I respond to these people and not lose them? Remember, Paul is not trying to win a case on biblical truth. He's also equally trying to win people he's, he, he wants to minister to. And so, be quick to hear, slow to respond. It's very important. And that should mark, mark us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We should be quick to hear. At the same time, we should be slow in responding. That was the mark of our Lord Jesus Christ from whom the Apostle Paul learned this lesson from. Our Lord in John 8 was brought, they brought a woman caught in adultery. And they wanted the Lord to declare a sentence upon her so that they would stone the woman to death. When you read John chapter 8, the Lord didn't just ask, answer them immediately. He heard what they said. That's be quick to hear, but slow in responding. So our Lord took time. If you read the chapter, he bent down, trying to write something on the on the on the, on the ground. I think whatever he is writing, he's trying to fig, trying to make sure that his response will be the right response that would calm the, the, the situation and bring glory to God. If he had responded immediately, he may have said something. That probably, I'm just saying in the, human, in the human stand, in the human point, he may have said something that he would have regretted saying. Rather, he took time to think before he answered. That's a, a lesson we, you and I need to learn. We should move over our answer and make sure that our answer would fulfill the purpose for which you, we have given that answer. We don't want to give an answer 
that will regret having given it. Or, or by saying, if I had known, I would have done it this, this way or the other way. That is, time, that is the reason why you need to take time, as Paul did. And, and, and James, who said, be quick to hear, James 1.19, be quick to hear, slow in responding. James 1.19, he learned this from his half-brother, Jesus Christ, that Christ, before he responds, uh, he would think through, and his answer would always bring them to will shame those who are trying to uh, trap him. So that's the very important lesson that we glean from this action. Uh, and Paul would think he didn't just get the letter and they started writing right away and, and wanted somebody to send it to them. But he would think he will think his way. How do we know that Paul thought his way out? That is number two. The number two is when you are opponent with grace and love. When you are opponent with grace and love. That's how Paul will deal. Will deal. This is a, a very serious matter, a very serious issue. And Paul will deal with this issue with grace and love. He he would he doesn't want to be confrontational. He would have started in verse one or two with punches, but he didn't. Rather, he started his letter with grace. Look at verse two. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. That's a that's greeting. That's a gracious greeting from the Apostle Paul. In this greeting, there is no, no, you, you couldn't read that and find that Paul was angry, but that Paul was trying to diffuse this falsehood head on. He started by greeting them and expressing love to the church. Uh, in verse 3, we give thanks to the Father. So, to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. But you see, in this verse 2, as I thought in the past, when you look at verse 2, read, let me read it again. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Hold that. Flip to Romans chapter 1, verse 7. We've done this before. The repetition helps us a lot. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord. Just in this two, in this uh, verse seven in Romans one seven, go back to Colossians one two. What do you, what is missing there? Look, look carefully. What is missing? In verse 2 of Colossians chapter 1 and Romans chapter 1 verse 7, where Paul greets them, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What is missing in verse 2 here in Colossians? That's correct. Jesus Christ is not mentioned there. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2 Paul is greeting the Corinthians to the church of God which is at Corinth to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus saints look at verse 3 grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, what is missing in Colossians 1 verse 2? 
You are right again. The, the name Jesus Christ was not there. This is Paul's pattern of greeting. We, uh, let's just not say, think it's, it's, it's only in the uh, Colossians, in the uh, Corinthians, and the uh, Romans. Turn to Philippians, Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1. Philippians 1 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians. Let's see if he did the same thing in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amazing, isn't it? Being that these epistles, Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, they were all sent, written from the prison and sent at the same time. They were all prison epistles, written. And so Paul, putting grace to you, peace from God the Father, in all the epistles, four of them that he sent, he put the Father. But when he came to the Colossians, he dropped Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because he didn't want to be confrontational with the church. He didn't want to be confrontational. He wanted to use wisdom. Because to put God, the Father, and Jesus Christ along with his greeting is to make both of them equal. And to start that way, from the get-go is to cause trouble. Many people would have been angry and walked away and not even want to listen to what Paul is saying. And so Paul dropped that until he, he can gain their trust. He can gain their interest in what he has to say. So the lesson there for us is that we should be a believers. We should be believers that avoid confrontational. You never win by being confrontational. Confrontational never achieves anything. Rather, it intensifies problem. It intensifies problem. Learn how to hold your tongue. Learn how to respond. That's one of the that's a, a, a benchmark of spiritual growth. If you can bridle your mouth and control your mouth. You know that whatever, when you want to speak, let your word be seasoned with salt. Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15. See what, what we, what comes in, out from our mouth will make or break us. What comes out of our mouth will make or break us. Some of the problems we create or have in life is because we failed to bridle our mouth. We failed to control our mouth. We failed to say the right thing at the right place at the right time. Verse 18. It says, A hot tempered man stares up shry, but is slow to anger, pacifies contention, slow to anger, which means you are very careful before you even uh, explode, if, if it, even if it's necessary to explode, the slow to anger pacifiers. The pacifiers is that thing that you put in children's mouth. You got a pacifier. If you want to keep a child from talking, just put a pacifier in the mouth, and the child will stop talking. Uh, every, every time I read that verse, it reminds me of a woman who was always beaten by her husband. husband her husband was an alcoholic, and every time the husband will come home, and he will say something, and the husband, and the wife will respond, and then the husband will give it to her. And every time, beating, red eyes, blue, blue, blue cheek, everything. 
And so this woman became so tired of this and went to a village doctor and said, and told the village doctor, I, I want you to prepare a medicine can, for me so that my husband has been beating me. I, I, I want to, I don't want to be, I don't want to be his punching bag all the time. This man went into his chamber and put, I don't know what he put together, maybe some honey, a little bit coke, a little bit Sprite, whatever he mixed. Concussion to the woman, I said, and told the woman, go home and hide this medicine. Don't put it where your husband will see it. Whenever your husband comes home, you go right away and take a little bit sick and hold it in your mouth. Don't swallow it. And this woman will do that all the time. The husband will come home and she will run quickly and she will take a sip from that concussion that the, the village doctor gave her. And the husband will say things and say things and, and will ravel back and forth in the house and the wife never said a word. Why? She was holding something in her mouth. So she couldn't take, she couldn't talk, that's specified. And because she, she didn't talk, the husband didn't beat her. And after one week, it, it happened every time. And so the wife went back to the doctor and said, your medicine is so powerful. Yeah, it is powerful because she wasn't talking. If she had swallowed that medicine and talked, no doubt about it, the man would have done the same thing over and again. You see, the, the key there is be careful responding in a way that you receive the same message can ignite fire. Passive fire is very crucial. Look at verse 28 of the same Proverbs. And, and the, the writer tells us, The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. That, that's, that's it right there. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. Are you a righteous believer? If you are, the Bible tells us that you don't just say things. You want to think through before you say it. That's what the Bible says. The heart of a righteous ponders how to respond. A, a person who always fires back, fires back, doesn't think before he or she responds. And that's often we get into trouble because we don't pay attention to the problem that arises. To learn not to speak in a haste. Proverbs 26, verse 4 and 5. Proverbs 26, verse 4 and 5. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. Answer a fool as his folly desires, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Don't answer a fool. In other words, what he's saying here is, don't let a fool bring you to his own standard. Don't let a fool bring you to his own level. If a person is an immature and he's acting as an immature, don't act, don't act in the same manner he's acting. Otherwise, both of you will be mature. If you are, if you think you've matured, treat an immature in a way that he will know or he will, or she will know that he is a fool. You don't have to call a person a fool, but by the way you treat the person, he will come back and say, "I'm really a fool." Why? Because you didn't make yourself a fool. Otherwise, you are both fools. Nobody knows the difference. So that's maturity stands out by making sure that the way you respond is not the same way a fool or immature believer responds. Otherwise, both of you will be on the same level. That's what Proverbs says. Do not answer a fool according to his folly. Don't, don't jump in the same wagon with a fool. But be gracious 
Ephesians 4.15. Ephesians 4.15. Paul is, Paul is telling the church at Ephesus about what they say. Verse 15, but speak, speaking the truth in love, which we are to grow up in all aspects into him, who is the head even Christ. Speaking truth in love, speaking truth in love. In other words, even though what you have is truth, no doubt about it, but present it in love. Present it in love. That's what Paul is asking us. Colossians 4 verse 6. Colossians 4 6. In fact, back to Ephesians 4 29. Before we go to Colossians, Ephesians 4 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. But only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment that it may give grace to those who hear. In other words, whenever you are conversing or whenever, whenever you are telling a person, be sure that what you are saying it will edify. Uh, and that's why in Proverbs, you hold your mouth when you are angry. When you are angry, you can never be angry and tell the person, God bless you. It doesn't happen that way. If you are angry, you're going to cause, you're going to cause the person, you're going to say things. But if you hold your anger, you will be able to know how to respond and what you say will be grace, graceful or gracious to the person that you are responding to. Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be with grace. Always. Let your speech always be with grace. Seasoned as it were with salt, so that you may know how you should respond to each, or each person. In other words, let your conversation be seasoned with salt. Deliver it on the platter of grace so that those around you will benefit. That is the mark of spiritual growth, if not spiritual maturity. When you when you are a maturing believer, all your aim as a believer is edification. Edification. How do I edify? My brother who is close to me. How do I edify the other person that is near me? So Paul is showing this. He's putting this into practice by not comforting the church, by telling them that, look, Jesus, by the way, Jesus is equal to the Father. By my, through my greeting, you should know that. No, he laid it out. But he will come later on in verse 15 when he will present Jesus as the image of the invisible God. Until then, he will gain the attention. He will gain, he will show them his love, how he prayed for them, and what he's praying for. He will gain their trust and attention, and then he will come one. Jesus is the invisible image of God the Father. What a, what a beautiful display of uh, maturity. First Peter chapter 3 verse 15. First Peter 3 verse 15. Peter speaking to his audience, he tells them, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always being ready, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. And this is where apologia, we are all defense attorneys of Jesus Christ. We are all, all of us are defense attorneys of Jesus Christ. Uh, and how can we defend Jesus Christ? The, the first, the way we defend Jesus Christ is by acquiring knowledge. 
knowing the, 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 the manual, knowing the constitution, which is the word of God, back and forth. You don't want a, 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 an attorney that doesn't know the constitution or know the law. And so Peter said, be ready. That's why we have this class. And that's why uh, you, nothing should come between you whenever you have Bible class. Yeah. Your study of the word of God should be your highest priority. Because it's important. That's why you are here. You are here as an attorney of Jesus Christ. You are here as an attorney of heavenly kingdom. You are here as an attorney representing the entire kingdom of heaven. And if you are an attorney, you don't want to be a lousy attorney. You want to be an attorney that is prepared so that whenever anybody meets you at any place, at any time, at any juncture, you'll be prepared to deliver what you know about the kingdom of heaven. That's what Peter said here. Count, be ready to give an answer on account for the hope that is in you. Yet with gentleness and reverence, with gentleness and reverence, don't be rude. Don't, don't be confrontational. With gentleness, understanding that the person, for you to be gentle, you have to know the person you are talking to. He's not like you. He doesn't possess the same spirit you have. He's controlled by the evil one. He, he's, he's, he, he doesn't have the mindset you have. And so, if you wanna, if he yell, if he yells and you yell back, that means you are you both are fools. But if he yells and you don't yell, he calls himself fool. He will call himself a fool for yelling at you because you didn't yell back. And so. Avoid confrontation. Or that's what Paul did here. Very important. Number three, the third lesson or the third application here is conquer jealousy by being thankful for the success or progress of other people. Conquer jealousy by being thankful for the success and progress of other people. Uh, naturally, we have by nature from adam and eve our nature is a nature of jealousy we will we always like to be jealous about the progress of another person if somebody is progressing and we're not progressing we want to we want to uh, criticize the person we want to bring the person low we want to say ah oh, that's not really progress and the reason why he or she is doing that is because she or she she or he or she did that and did that. You want to talk to the person, you want to criticize, you want to be critical of the individual, you don't want to, you don't even like that the person is progressing. If it's a job and the person is doing well at job, ah, that person, the reason why is because they are so close to the boss. He is so close to the boss, that's why he's progressing. Instead of being thankful. Instead of saying, God, thank you for the progress of this individual. If you start saying thank you when other people are progressing, you can never be jealous of their progress. And it's, it's a big thing. That's a big challenge. Because it's not our nature. Our nature is, why not me? God, why I, I am the person who is supposed to be promoted, and not he or she? But a believer who is maturing, we learn a lesson that the Apostle Paul is teaching us here. A, person, a lesson that Paul himself learned so well. He was thankful for the success of the church. This church, Paul had nothing to do with this church. He never, he never planted this church. Paul, remember, he didn't plant this church, and yet he was thankful for this church. Look at verse 3. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. Wow. Praying for a church you never saw. Praying for the progress that you just heard, that people are progressing, and their progress is causing you to be excited. That is daring is spiritual growth. Daring is spiritual maturity. Knowing that 
we are all one body in Christ. Anyone's progress is your progress. You are not jealous because that person is doing better and they are not doing. You are thankful to God that he's making that person to, to progress. In fact, you pray for that individual to progress. It's not it's, that, that if you are in that sector, one thing you will do in your life, you will destroy self-centeredness. For you cannot be self-centered and at the same time be praying and thankful for the progress of other people. But if you are praying and being thankful for other people, you position yourself in a well, glory in the sight of God. And so that's another lesson from this verse or verses we have gone through. Number four. The fourth thing, live a life of hope. Live a life of hope. We must be a people of who live a life of hope. We don't belong here. And this is this place is not our home. And knowing that this place is not our home, you have an unparalleled hope, a hope that is set beyond us, a hope that is in heaven. And 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 that's constantly your mind. That's why Jesus said, "Whatever your treasure is, that's where your mind will be." And and Paul said the same thing in Colossians. When we get to Colossians chapter three, Paul is going to tell us. Set your mind in the things above. Uh, and so we must learn to live, we must learn as believers to live our lives under the umbrella of hope. Under the umbrella of hope. Why not? Colossians 4 through 6, Colossians 1 4 through 6. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you pre previously heard in the word of truth the gospel which has come to you just in all the world it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it has been doing in you and since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. That's amazing. Why, they were, why did they find themselves in this state? The reason is so simple. They, are, they, they now have fixed their mind in the things above. They have hooked their mind, they, are, they have hooked their hope beyond here. And so, because they have hooked their hope, Tie their hope in the things in heaven. It, it gives them, it gives them perspective of things below. You see, when you are looking for a reward, you're looking for a prize, you're looking for something that is that is far outweighs what you have here. It puts everything you have here in the right perspective. It, it puts, it gives it right meaning. If, if you really understand what heaven is all about. The, the problem with Christians today is that we don't really know what heaven is all about. That, that's a fact. Many Christians don't know, they don't have a, a glimpse of what Jesus talked about heaven or what heaven is all about. If they do, the things of this life will really become a stain, the songwriter puts it. It, 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 it will become as something you can't even put your head around. And so Paul sees that this church, because of hope, they were people of hope. Romans 5.5, 5, Romans 5.5 5 tells us about hope. Hope is not just, I hope so. Hope, 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 as the Bible uses it, is absolute confidence. Absolute confidence. Absolute expectation. Verse 5, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out 
within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given us. So we know for sure that this hope will not disappoint us because it is rooted in God. And because of the hope we have, I don't care what happens in this life, they don't have weight. They, they weigh as paper, paper. Try to put a paper on a scale and see how much it will weigh. They weigh, let me put it this way. Get all your problems, wrap them together. I don't care what they are. I don't want to diminish you and trouble. But put them all together. Call them paper. Put them on a scale and see how much it will weigh. Compared to what will be revealed to you one day, when you close your eyes or when Christ returns, if you know that something is coming your way that will that as surpasses the problems and the suffering that you face, that hope strengthens your heart to the point that whatever you are going through, you don't it doesn't swallow you. Romans chapter eight verse seventeen puts it correctly. I'm, I'm sorry, verse 18, Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is not is to be revealed to us. Paul said they are not worthy. They are, it's, it's like trying to compare a squirrel, a, a, a squirrel leg, squirrel, you get a squirrel that runs around your yard, you catch one, and you get the le- get one leg of it. You try to compare it with the leg of an elephant. That's not comparison. So that's what Paul is saying here. That whatever we are going through, I don't care what it is. Paul said, it's nothing in comparison in light of what will be revealed to us. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Paul will say the same thing to the Corinthians. Verses 16 through 18. Second Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. That's hope. This body is being decayed. I don't care how long you live very soon, the body will start falling apart. Even if you try to fix it. By plastic surgery, how many times can you fix it? Very soon it will give way to tell you that the Bible doesn't lie. The body will decay, and every day the wrinkles you can't fix the wrinkles anymore. You can fix the wrinkles and put the oil and pour, and you keep fixing it and fixing until one day those wrinkles will repair to the point you can't fix them anymore. And you just say, "Hey." Forget about it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Forget about those wrinkles. Because the body will continue to decay. But the inner man, that inner spirit, that person that Christ has created within us, continues to give us hope. And that hope pierces through the corridors of heaven. And you as a believer, when you look down on this planet Earth, and you look up through the spiritual eyes, into the things that God is piling up for you, you go to bed and sleep, knowing that they are not in comparison. And Paul says in verse 17, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an internal weight of glory. Far beyond all comparison, while we look not in the things which are seen, but are the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Temporary, eternal. Temporary, eternal. So you look to those things that are temporary, and you know that the things that are permanent, that's what your hope is fixed upon. Number five. The fifth thing that Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 18 presented to us, the fifth lesson application for our lives Colossians 1 verses 18 1 through 18 a hunger for his word must be our first priority 
A hunger for the word of God must be our first priority. Whether in pray, whether when we are praying, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the first thing you should pray for you yourself the first day you became a believer is that God will help you to get to know Him. Uh, that God will create in you hunger for His word. So a hunger for this word must be our first priority, of our first prayer request. And we find this in verse 9. Uh, verse 9, Colossians 1, verse 9. Here Paul prayed for them. For this reason, also since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the first thing knowledge of his will knowledge not that you will be uh, protected from uh, coronavirus not that you will be protected from the the onslaught of the emperor not that you will be protected paul didn't pray for all this thing. what he prayed is knowledge because the knowledge of god will give you an insight a broader insight of what is going on in the world if you know what is going on, if you know what is going on in the world, you will have peace. You will not be distracted. Philippians 3, 10, Paul said that I may know you, that I may know you, and the power of his resurrection. We, we as believers should never rest until we know God as we ought to know him. That should be our yearning, to know him. And if you are praying that I may know you and you are not reading the Bible, you are joking, you are making a mockery of yourself. You are making mockery of yourself. If you are praying, God help me to know you, and you are not reading the Bible on a daily basis, you are making mockery of yourself. To know God is to know him through his word. You cannot know God apart from his word. And so the, the, praying that you may know him is asking the Holy Spirit to help you dig into the word, to help you open your eyes to the truth that is written in the scripture therein. Jesus Christ, when he prayed for the church, uh, the first thing he prayed in his high priestly prayer was clearly uh, that they may know you, the only true God. Knowledge of God through his word. Number six, rest assured of the loss, rest assured of the lost control of your destiny. That's the lesson we learn from Colossians. Rest assured of the Lord's control of your destiny. And that is in Colossians 1 verse 14. Yeah. I'm sorry, verse, seven, verse 16, 17. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. In him all things hold together. That includes your future progress, your future blessing, your present blessing. He is held in him. He holds it together. And so you have should not be concerned about what will happen with somebody under court me. Nobody will under court because he holds everything together by his power. No. Nobody is sharing, holding your future with him. He holds your future in his by his power. And that's what it means that Jesus Christ controls history. That's a, a very powerful lesson for us. The yeah, number eight, number seven, rather. The number seven, the lost preeminency in everything, the lost preeminency in everything guarantees your present and future blessing and glory. The lost preeminency in everything guarantees your present and future blessing and glory. Why? It's on top of everything, in between, beneath. He occupies everything. In between is your blessing for time and a blessing for eternity. So that's you should have confidence. You should not be afraid. You should not worry about, will I ever be successful in this life? 
the one who will make you to be successful is the very one who indwells you. And that's why in Colossians 3, he said, let Christ be the umpire of your heart. Let him be at home. Make, make sure that Christ is at home because he is the one that determines your future. He is the one that holds your future. If he holds your future, if he is the umpire, if he is the one blowing the whistle of your future, the Bible says, make him feel at home in your heart. Give him a comfortable place to stay in your heart as he leads your life, as he fulfills the plan that the Father has for you. And finally, therefore, Christ must have Christ must have first place in your life and my life. Therefore, Christ must have first place in your life and in my life. And God has done us a favor. You see, this coronavirus is a blessing in disguise. It is a blessing in disguise in the sense that God has is using this time. He has used this time to send us home so that we can really, really evaluate, take inventory of our lives and determine what is most important in this life. As we see people die like flies, we see people suffer. God is asking us to really take inventory and think of what is more important in this life. Is that your job? Is that your vacation? God has shut down everything that we value. If you value entertainment, he shut entertainment down. If you value sports, he shut sports down part of entertainment. There are people, I know people that, uh, few, not a lot of people, that every weekend they must see one movie or the other. And God said, is that where your life is? Watch me, watch this. All theaters shut all over the world. Let me see uh, which you are, you, you, you say, well, I, I can't live for a week without going to a, a beach. Is that right? I'm going to close all beaches. You say, well, I can if I don't take a vacation, I just don't know how to live. Well, for the last three, two or three months, you have really found how to live because you haven't taken any vacation. And this is God speaking to the church. This is God speaking to your heart. If, if, if you are not making an adjustment by this time, something is really wrong. If you haven't taken the, this past two or three weeks or months to really enter into that soul, something is desperately wrong. God has locked us up in our various homes so that we can really evaluate as the time is ticking. Time is ticking for every one of us. We don't have the time we think we have. Some of us have only one week. Some have one year, some have 10 years, some have 30 years, 40 years. I don't know. But what I do know is that we don't have the time we think we do. And time is Running, running out. And we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ should do whatever we can to honor the very one who left the throne room of heaven and came down. Really, just think of it. Think of it. Christ stepped out of his throne 